This is a Willits Point Shea Stadium bound 7 express train. The next and last stop is Willits Point Shea Stadium. Oh, every oh my goodness, this has been such a long day. <laughs> I'm on three hours of sleep. Uh, had to apologize to these kind gentlemen above me, had a little bit of technical difficulties on uh on Wardy's show, but we got it working, got a little bit in there. Um, he was kindly enough to let me go to come and do this show. So here we are, Subway to Shea. Till Mutz, Till Mutz, Till Mets do his part. <laughs> We're not, it's not June yet, Ant. It's not June yet. <laughs> oh, goodness. They're going to have to give me a lot of, I might have to come to your house for that, that slice of pizza that you're talking about. Uh, um, <laughs> Till Mets do his part, John Sapinaro, Matt E.B. Ibanez. And uh, it is the eve. Well, not technically. I guess tomorrow is the eve now that uh, the game got rained out. But uh, we are here. The Mets season is upon us. Uh, this is the first of many series previews that I will be doing, having many guests, but there's no two guys I want to start off with more than my boys. Till Mets do his part. How you guys doing? Thanks, man. I'm doing pretty good. Um, we just got done, uh, like you, doing our show, So uh, or doing another show. It was ours, and in your case, I guess not. But, man, um, it, it's a good time of year to be talking Mets, but it gets – it does get exhausting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You remember when we talked about like that doing one of those twenty-four hour things? I don't think I could do it. Like, well, I'm not doing I, it. I'm I, not I have been, I have been nonstop since I think it was four o'clock when we I started a space for about an mm -hmm. hour and a half, then went to Wardy, and now we're doing this. I'm like ready to pass out. So th th we might get a little delirious here today, but we're gonna have some fun. Ibby, how you doing, man? I'm doing good, and it's always a pleasure to be on the show with you, as I always start off when when talking with you. But I, I, you mentioned it, and it's the truth. This is the first time that Till Mets do us part as a duo is finally on this show. We've been on separately. We've had some fun. We've had great conversations. John has had two parts. He had a two-parter. He, he had a two-part. My part likes to talk. Okay, he gets to have two That's parts. because I talk. It's I, I talk. <laughs> I only got to have the one, you know, the couple of times, but still always a fun time is had. We're going to have a great discussion. Can't wait to interact with the chat as well, but I'm very pumped up that we're finally, uh, all three of us are doing a show on the Subway to Shea channel. Yeah. And it, it's linked to yours as well. So if anyone's watching on Till Mets to his part, you can check mm -hmm. it out there. Gentlemen, 47 people. We haven't started talking yet, really. So 47 people are in here. Deron Rivera, Carlos Ramos. Shout out to you guys. Douglas Barnes is in here. We got so many people. Aaron from Blue Shirts Banter is in here. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of people, a lot to talk about. And uh, it's all about What's going to happen on Friday now at 140? The Mets will be taking on the Milwaukee Brewers. I think the scheduled or the probable pitching matchup right now is uh, Freddie Peralta versus Jose Quintana. Uh, how do you guys feel about Jose Quintana getting the start? Um, I know he's the most veteran of the pitchers on the roster or in the rotation. Code I sang is out until around mid May, June. We saw him actually start throwing some. Some uh, is it BP? He's just he was just throwing the ball around. I don't think he yeah. put any emphasis on any of those uh, those throws. But we got to see him throw, and which is great. Um, and I'm happy to see him back. But we got Jose Quintana on the mound, and, and the rest of the rotation. I even have the graphic that I can really pull back up. Uh, where do I have that? Here we go. Here's the rotation: Jose Quintana, Luis Severino, Tyler McGill, Sean Manaya, and Adrian Hauser. Are you guys good with Quintana getting that first start, or would you have had it? Would you have gone a different way? Uh, I'll I'll take it first, John, since uh, we did talk about this on our show, and I'll just read it where I was on it, and that was when we asked and said, you know, who do we think is going to get the opening day nod? I think we might have said it a week out before it actually happened. I was on board with Jose Quintana being the guy to get the ball, so I, I'm fine with him being that choice, mainly because I, I thought he encapsulated what was trying to be the focus of this year's uh, off season, and that was we're going to go out there. We're going to we're going to try to provide some solid innings. We're going to play some defense, and then we're going to try to jump the scoreboard. And I thought that Jose Quintana 
was that type of pitcher that's, you know, the veteran lefty, the workman who's been there, done that. I think this is his second or maybe third uh, opening day he's ever gotten a chance to do. Uh, so I was fine with it because I think that's, that's what they're going to try to do, try to get a solid five to six innings out of him, get into, the, into that new bullpen, if you will, uh, to hopefully shut it down for a couple of innings before we get to hear those trumpets blare play some defense and try to win a ball game like we usually do on opening day. And then I'll, uh, then away we go. But in terms of, am I happy with it? I'm, I'm fine with it. I, I think it makes sense. Um, let me say this. I, I'm fine with it. I don't have a major issue. Um, but like I said on our show, it's not the direction I would have went in. Um, I would have went a little bit splashier. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is your birthday. You're welcome. Um, no, but, uh, <laughs> I, I would have went, I would have went a little bit splashier. I think, um, I probably would have went to Severino, I think, mm. uh, just it, uh, based on spring results too, right? Like nothing yeah. exists in a vacuum. And, you yeah. know, if Severino was getting bombed all spring, I don't think I'm going there. But um, I, I would have went for a higher upside pitcher. Um, I like Quintana. I'm happy they didn't move on from him. I know there were some talks early about potentially trading him. But with so many holes in the rotation, I never thought that was realistic. Um, I think you're lucky to have him on the deal that you have. And look, with uh, Senga going down – it kind of uh, bears fruit that way that he's your opening day starter. So I'm not upset by it by any stretch, but um, on our show, I said I would have went with uh, Severino. So I'll just stay consistent and just say that I would have went with Severino. Yeah, that, that would actually been a, a uh, an interesting move for the Mets. They have already put Tyler McGill as the third starter, which I, I thought they were going to slot him in at, at five, but I guess scheduling wise and how everything worked out that Tyler McGill gets that, that third spot. Uh, Savvy will pitch Saturday, and then I guess McGill will pitch uh, Sunday. Uh, how are you guys feeling about the lineup? It seems to be to be set now. Now that DJ Stewart uh, mm -hmm. is officially a part of the team, because they were going to just bring him up north. They didn't know if if he was going to be on the team. They were actually looking outside the organization to see if they can catch someone either off waivers or through trade, and that mm -hmm. didn't end up working. So DJ Stewart will be on the team, and I think the if I pull it up here that the uh, Anthony DeComo's lineup was – where is that? Maybe I went too far. Here we go. Uh, Brandon Nimmo, Francisco Lindor, Pete Alonso, Jeff McNeil, Starling Marte, DJ Stewart, Francisco Alvarez, Brett Beatty, and then Harrison Bader rounding that out at nine. I don't know if that's going to be the starting lineup. Some people have mentioned, and I'm pretty sure, sure you, you heard it. <laughs> it should be. Uh, I'm pretty sure um, you heard it too, Ibby, that on, someone posted a picture yeah. of the scoreboard, and it mm -hmm. had Tyrone Taylor in the lineup and Bader not. And Keith mm -hmm. kind of actually explained it, that um, the fact that uh, Bader does not hit, hit well against righties and having Tyrone Taylor in the lineup would be a, a better lineup because he's a better, you know, he's better at hitting righties. So mm -hmm. what do you guys think of the lineup? I'm not a fan of McNeil at, at uh, you know, at the four spot. Um, I prefer someone else there, even if it's Francisco Alvarez or if they even want to put DJ Stewart, who has who has that power stroke. But McNeil to me has to be, you know, he and once JD Martinez comes, you could put him in mm -hmm. at five. That's fine. But uh, I think the fact that, you know, a guy like Starling Marte, who I don't know, to me this spring, I wasn't really impressed. Um, I know he hit a double in one of his, you know, final at bats, but I really feel like he wasn't hitting the ball with any type of, you know, authority or getting it out of the infield as much. So, um, I'm concerned with him. Jeff McNeil still coming back from his injury, so he didn't look great. Uh, there's a lot of ifs uh, in, in this lineup, and and they really did not show as as well as the pitching was during mm -hmm. spring. The hitting was not at, at all well. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess I'll take this one first. Um, yeah. I said on our show, this was our uh, bold takes that we always do heading into the season. And uh, one of my bold takes, my last one was um, that uh, Tyrone Taylor is going to have a better offensive season than Starling Marte. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that's a little open ended, but, you know, I just think I don't know how long either guy is going to be around, how much guy either guy is going to play. I just don't have a lot of faith in Starling Marte. I think he's easy to root for. He seems like a nice guy. Um, he always <laughs> plays baseball the right way um, and stuff like that. But, you know, there's just – he looks old to me. And I think when you're – you know, what what is he now, 34 years old, whatever, mm -hmm. coming off double groin injury. And I said to Ibby as we were rounding out the show that – 
Uh, spring training numbers don't matter, but spring training results do matter. So yeah. I use three people as the example. Francisco Lindor plays every day. He's coming off 30-30. He didn't have a good spring. I'm not really concerned. Starling Marte didn't have a good spring. He's coming off a terrible season where he barely played and had – dual groin surgery. So I'd like to see some results out of him, you know, and then the person you kind of put in the middle is like the Brett Beatty's of the world where he had a good spring, uh, but he had a good spring last year and he had a terrible season. And so when I look at those three players, a guy like Beatty is kind of more like, well, I, I still have to see more, you know, with Lindor, I don't necessarily need to see anything. I know what kind of player he is with um, Marte. I'm scared. And with a guy like Beatty, I think it's a bit of a coin flip. And so um, I think they have a lot of good players. Um, I think they have some question marks too on this team. And um, I, I think Starling Marte is a huge one. And I think Jeff McNeil is a huge one. Um, I, I know I've gotten into it with people over my opinions on Jeff McNeil. Let me just say this. I like Jeff McNeil. I think Jeff McNeil's a good baseball player, but I think he has to do certain things really well to be the best version of himself. And we're coming off of two out of three years where he was bad. I know he picked it up at the tail end of last season and he got to 270 and some of his numbers don't look terrible and they're closer to, you know, what you expect from him. But, you know, he's just two years removed from hitting 251 and having a brutal year. I, I, I just... I'm not saying he can't hit in the like, you know, second in the lineup, or uh, I'm not saying that Marte can't hit second or hit fifth, but they got to show it to me first. And I haven't, I, I need them to rebound. Um, you know, and that's just what it is. I, Joel C just said exactly what I've been saying. If McNeil doesn't hit 300, he's useless. I think he's a useless offensive player if he doesn't hit 300 because everything else he does is predicated on him getting a lot of hits. He knocks in runs. If he gets a lot of hits, he has a good on base percentage. If he gets a lot of hits, he'll hit for a little bit more power, you know, extra base hits, doubles and stuff like that. If he gets a lot of hits, if he's grounding out on the first pitch to the shortstop weekly and then cursing when he gets to first base, you, you, that's, that's a big part of what McNeil is. And I don't care about the cursing. I'm making light of it, but like, that's a big part of what he is. You got to take the good with the bad. I know he's just off of the batting title two years ago, but like I said, it's, it's two out of three bad years. Can he prove to us that he's Jeff McNeil from two years ago? Can Starling Marte prove to us that he's the Starling Marte from two years ago before we put them in, you know, number two and number four or number four and number five in the lineup when you got guys, I know they're young, but like, look, I don't know if Alvarez is going to hit 210 or you know, 280, but I know he's probably going to hit 30 home runs. So let, why are we batting him seventh so that we can bat Jeff McNeil fourth? That's insane to me. Yeah. You know, I, I'm, I look back at Jeff McNeil stats, 2019, he hit 23 home runs, 23. He was 23. Juice, home ball. Runs, Juice, ball. Juice ball. Unreal. Unreal yeah. for him. Someone brought up a question about Starling Marte and mm -hmm. I want to pull it up here. Like Aaron from Blue Shirt Banter said, would you guys want Marte at leadoff? If he's no. 2022 Marte, I would. I mean, based on, for me at least, I would say no, uh, mainly because I, I like Brendan Nimmo there. I think Brendan Nimmo has found a niche, and he allows us to jump the scoreboard early, which I think is going to be a main – point for this team this uh this season if they're going to if they're going to succeed it's it's getting out getting it and getting out front early which is why i think pete alonso batting third getting up in the first inning is a big part of that um part of that thought process and uh you know when it comes to the lineup in general just throw my two cents in real quick i'm not going to speak too much on it mainly because i think the first we'll call it 10 to 10 days to, to two weeks until jd comes up it's going to be in flux a little bit um, in terms of trying to find a little bit of consistency on the back end. Uh, but I think once JD's here, it kind of solidifies the top end, at least. You know what, who's going to be hitting in those first four to five spots. And then be, be whatever it may be, depending on the hot hand, is what develops over that time as the season progresses. So I'm not going to jump out and, and bash opening day like I know some people will, um, or like even the first couple of days. Uh, I'm going to allow it to be what it's going to be until JD gets here. And then we'll see where the chips may fall in terms of the rest of the lineup. Uh, but yeah, I can, I can, you know, echo the same things John just did. I can echo the things about Jeff McNeil, not needing to see him getting the most at bats. I got into it with someone uh, on my, uh, in the, uh, the Facebook community that we have for, for our show. When I 
you know, someone mentioned the lineup today and they wanted Jeff McNeil batting second. And I said, I don't agree with that. And I, and I gave my reasoning as to why, um, you know, about jumping the scoreboard and putting guys that have power. And the whole idea is getting the guys that you want up in the biggest spots, the most at bats. I don't care about the at-bats total at the end of the season. It's about the game itself. It's game by game, and you want to get your best hitters the most opportunities at the dish in the biggest spots when it's time to score runs. And we've said it on our show, and I'm sure you will echo it as well. Those guys include Brandon Nimmo, Francisco Lindor, Pete Alonso, eventually J.D. Martinez, and Francisco Alvarez. Those are the guys that we want to see up the most, and they should be the ones that are at the front of the lineup. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, sorry, I don't want um, Marte uh, in the leadoff spot, and it's it's a couple of reasons why. Again, just to echo what I said a few minutes ago, prove it first. You know, if he proves it, then sure, you can mess around with it on days where you know Nimo needs a day off or whatever the case may be. I don't see that happening, but if we get to that point, sure. The other thing is, um, I had been kind of pushing this outside the box lineup before JD Martinez, which was Lindor leading off Alonzo second, Nimmo three and Alvarez fourth, giving your four best players, you know, the most at bats at the end of the season and all this stuff, just having them be up there in the biggest spots all the time and getting the most opportunities all the time. Well, that ship has kind of sailed now that they've signed JD Martinez, like just, don't overthink it. Put Nimmo in the one where he's very good and then go to Lindor in the two where he's very good. Put Alonzo in the three where, you know, he actually has somebody protecting him with JD Martinez behind him. And then eventually I think your five hitter is going to be Francisco Alvarez. So I don't think there's a need to move that stuff around, but yeah, before they sign JD Martinez, I even said on our show and I said it on Twitter, if Jeff McNeil is the Jeff McNeil of old and you want to bat him first and you want to put Nimmo two and you want to move some things around and be creative, I'm for that. If Starling Marte is Starling Marte of old and you want to bat him lead off to, to move Nimmo down a little bit, I'm with that too. There are some machinations you can, you can do, but now I think that ship has sailed because at least on the days when JD Martinez plays and assuming everybody's healthy and all this stuff, I, I don't see a reason to shoehorn some of those other guys into the top of the lineup. So like you put Marte first, Who's hitting second? Is it Nimmo? Well, then where's Lindor hitting? Is he hitting third? Is Pete hitting four? Is JD hitting five? Like, I, I don't know. To me, that's kind of overthinking it, especially if you don't know what you're getting out of these players. And right now, anybody who says they know what Marte or McNeil is going to give you is wrong. Yeah, no, yeah. yeah. And I, I, at some points, I would even consider moving McNeil all the way to either eight or nine and having him and Bader kind of be that, you know, bottom of the order that maybe they could create Great. a little bit of havoc at some point. I don't know if, if that's kind of an option for anyone, but I, that's something I would definitely consider. Yeah. I mean, uh, you yeah. would want someone like, like McNeil to get on base. So then if he's batting nine, yeah, allow him to slap the ball, get on base. So then Nimmo Lindor or Alonzo can hit a home run or drive him in with a double in the gap or Nimmo with a triple, whatever it may be to get a run, as opposed to putting McNeil in a spot where you're saying, Hey Jeff, go get us runs. It should be the other way around. Your job is to get on base. So then other people can drive you in not so much others getting on base and saying, Hey Jeff, go do the job that really is above what you really are as a player. You know, it's just one thing too about, about Jeff McNeil. And I, I said, I didn't want to bash him and here I am bashing him, but you know, <laughs> people talk about like, I think there is, I know Carson who's in the comments and, and has a great show too. Like, you know, he doesn't like these high contact guys. You know, he, he wants guys pulling the ball, hitting home runs, hitting extra base heads. And I'm not as extreme as he is on that take. Um, but I do see where the flaws are in a player like McNeil. He's a guy who sometimes makes what I would call too much contact because he doesn't walk enough. He puts the bat on the ball, but he doesn't barrel the ball necessarily. He's slapping the ball the other way. And yeah, if he slaps the ball over the shortstop's head with a runner on second base late in the game in a tie game, that's terrific. But there's been a lot of times in the last three years, the batting title year, maybe notwithstanding, but over the course of the last three years where McNeil has come up with a runner on first, or a runner on first and second with one out, he swings at the first pitch, he hits the weakest possible, easiest double play ball to shortstop, and we're out of the inning on one pitch. I mean, again, you just have to acknowledge what Jeff McNeil is. I think he does a lot great, but I also think he does a lot not so great. And I think there are some people who just love him because he plays 
like baseball the old school way or whatever, but like it's not enough. Just acknowledge who he is. That's all. All right, guys. I need to take a quick break. We're going to come back and uh, we'll be right back with everybody. A quick bathroom break because I have not had a break <laughs> an entire day today. So we're, ah. we're going to stay in the chat. We'll be here and I'm going to take a quick break. I will be right back with all of you guys. Gentlemen, when they say you got to go, you got to go. You got to do what you got to do, man. <laughs> First time ever, three of us on, on the air together, and I had to run to the bathroom. Fun times. Fun times. Hopefully that's not a precursor to what's going to happen this season. And there um, I am just ranting about Jeff McNeil. This guy's like, I got to pee. Shut up. <laughs> Shut the hell Shut up. up. Jeff, McNeil. Shut <laughs> Jeff McNeil. We all want, we all saw your Twitter, dude. Enough. <laughs> It's definitely <laughs> till P do his part. Subway uh, to P. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> Trucker tone doing dookie. Yep. Well, <laughs> all of the above, man. <laughs> We're trying to provide oh content. Here. You're killing me, Tone. You're killing me. I, you, you, you learn. <laughs> let's just say um, 
I, I've been working in in live event for eight years, and you learn certain skills <laughs> when you work in live <laughs> events. <laughs> let me just oh. put it. Let me just put it that way. You know, there's. Uh, oh my god. It's not necessarily healthy, but it does come in handy. Oh man. Oh my uh, god. <laughs> this is. <laughs> Trucker, Mitch Trucker, is Mitch Trucker podcast still doing his podcast? He does it here and there. He told me he was done, and then he said they did a season preview. I, I, he's got he's like Rick Flair. He, he retires every like, <laughs> couple of minutes. He's not. He's not going anywhere. He's. I think he's doing something. He wants to do something next week too. He's not going. He's, he's here to stay. Tad doing Trucker it. It's tone. You should keep doing it. It's Just good. keep doing it. Just keep doing. There it. There he goes. That's all right, good. man. Yeah. So with. Uh, <laughs> All the Jeff McNeil talk out of the way now. I know that's driving Carson absolutely nuts. Uh, us keep talking about uh, Jeff McNeil. Um, I am, like I said, the concerns there, obviously, for McNeil and Marte, because those two guys uh, are kind of like the linchpins of the lineup. Obviously, we have our heavy hitters at the top, but if these two guys don't get their act together, uh, it's going to be a long, long season for this offense. And they already have to worry about Brett Beatty, uh, at third, and and if he can finally find some, you know, stroke, uh, I, I know that I, I talked about this, and you've had her on too, uh, Lori Rubinson, who's great, uh, wonderful, Terrific. the best, um, yeah. one of the most knowledgeable sports fans I, I think I've ever like encountered and had the pleasure to talk with. You know, we were talking about the whole situation with, um, with, with Vientos and Beatty, and I, you know, it had me thinking. You know, what if the Mets, like their intentions was never to have both of these two in the lineup together, uh, maybe one or the other, but never to have both of them. Because we saw, you know, with Pat Regazzo posting that the Mets had reached out to Justin Turner at the winter meetings and, and tried getting him to be signed. And maybe it would have been Turner and Vientos in the lineup. And, but now we have J.D. Martinez. Uh, Vientos is like that hard luck loser this this time around. So I, I feel like. There was never a plan. Maybe it was like the last resort, but there was never really a plan to have both Vientos and Beatty in the lineup at the same time, at least for now. I mean, I think it's smart. Um, I've been yeah. talking on our show all off season long that, you know, I love baseball with young athletic uh, people playing it. Like I think baseball's better that way. I think a lot of people, they see the, the anomalies of the Bartolo Colones of the world. And they're like, Oh, it, it's great. You can do it. It's like that. Nah, it's not the steroid era anymore. You know, guys aren't playing at high, high levels into 35 and 38 and 40 years old, consistently, consistently. Mm -hmm. um, you need the young players to come up and you need young athletic players who can be versatile. So I'm all for that, but I also think guys have to earn it. And I don't think Vientos, has earned it. I don't think Beatty has earned it. And I think when you're a team that says you're going to try and be as competitive as possible, which the Mets have said all along and kudos to them for doing that, going out and getting JD Martinez. But if you're a team trying to do that, you can't just give the starting job to two people who really didn't earn it. I mean, yeah. you know, they both, you know, there was a lot made. AB brought it up on our show. Vientos had the most um, home runs on the team in spring training. And I think Beatty had the most hits or they were tied for the most hits. Well, they also had the most at bats because they had the most to prove. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you give them more at bats, obviously they're going to do better. And so um, I don't think, I don't know if I agree with you hundred percent Ant, where it was always their intention to not have both guys. Um, I think they would have, if certain things didn't break their way financially and some other stuff, I think they would have gritted and bared it. But, um, I think they're happier now. I mean, the proof is in the yeah. pudding because they went out and they got JD Martinez. And I know they structured the deal in such a way and they took a, you know, lighten the load salary wise and all that, but they still did it. They, they did it. They just yeah. went out flat, did it. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, I think that and to the point that I was saying on our show earlier, I, I think that it, there's nothing wrong with, you know, picking up a player like JD and then thus sending someone like Vientos down because there's still plenty of time, as David Stearns has said, and to your point earlier when you were on the spaces uh, and saying how David Stearns has not, has not lied to us once. He has not lied to us once yet. Everything he said has been on point. So, he said over time and time again that a player can still be analyzed, can still be looked at, can still be given an opportunity. 162 is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Just because something doesn't happen in the beginning doesn't mean it's not going to happen. I think Vientos is going to get some run at some point this season. What he does with it, we'll find out. But I'm with John in, in, in the understanding that you don't just hand something to someone. And I think things might have been a little bit different 
if Vientos came into the spring and absolutely dominated. Dominated to the point where it's like, okay, this guy's ready to take the next step. But to the point that I made before, that doesn't happen. And then when you couple that with some of the stats that James Shiano put out there from Met Stuff, talking about how, you know, when it comes to velocity, you know, Mark Vientos is hitting sub 200. I, I, I forgot what it was. If it was like 97 plus, whatever yeah. it may be, just struggling. It wasn't good. It, was, it wasn't good. And, and that kind of tells the story for those that don't understand when he – you know, came up last year and had his ups and downs, and then he got a little bit of consistent playing time. He looked a little bit better. But then when you see him get sent down, you're like, oh, this guy's dominating. This guy's got all this power. He's killing AAA. Why is he not getting time up here? Well, it's a different game. Okay, so it's a much different game between AAA and, and, and the bigs. So him not coming into the spring and absolutely dominating to the point where Beatty was last year. If Vietos came in this year and dominated the way that Beatty did last year, it might have changed the tone a little bit, but because that didn't happen, yeah, he hit the five home runs, but it was ugly. Like it, it wasn't, it wasn't a good five. Like, I mean, it was good because oh, they signed JD and then he hits two run homers. Like oh, this guy's pissed off. He's ready to go now. Blah blah blah. But overall, when you look at the entire picture, it wasn't the greatest of things. So yeah, when it falls into your lap and you can have a world class hitter at a cheap deal with the market bottomed out on. You take the opportunity and you run with it because you can still do what your plan was and seeing what you have in certain players while still competing, which is what J.D. Martinez allows you to do. As great as J.D. Martinez is and uh, uh, an amazing addition to this lineup, uh, the professional hitter he is, we got to remember last season he only played in 113 games. Mm Mm-hmm. Although one of the best seat, like 271, 33 home runs, 103 RBIs, I'll take that in a heartbeat. Yeah. But we got to remember that he's he's going to play around, I would say, 115 to 120. Could be less. Mm-hmm. Could be less than 113. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Vientos is going to get his opportunity. Um, I, I would like to see that. that Joel C. He ha- has the same uh, agreement that uh, will not play every day. Vientos will have opportunities. I think mm-hmm. so. Carson thinks that the intention was to give Joey Wendell the most uh, playing time. So I, I know he, I know Carson's uh, a little he's on a kick though. right now. So <laughs> Joey, we'll Wendell is like, Joey Wendell is like Wu Tang for the children. Yeah. <laughs> That's a crazy thing. Oh my um, God. I want to look at some of the, the pieces in the, the Milwaukee lineup here. Um, the, what, Anthony DeComo had them out, had Sal Frelick at center field, Wilson Contreras, a catcher, batting second, okay. Christian Yelich uh, batting third, Reese Hoskins, who was uh, could have been a possibility for the Mets um, out there. He'll be batting fourth after playing first base. Willie Adamas at shortstop, Gary Sanchez at DH, uh, Jackson Churio, who got the big contract. He's going to make his uh, big debut as well as uh, Bryce Terang at second base, rounding it out with the Jory Ortiz. Is there anyone in this lineup that Milwaukee has that intrigues you at all? Are we looking at Jackson Churio as the big guy? I mean, in my opinion, I, I'm excited to watch Jackson Churio because he's one of the top prospects in the game. It's going to be interesting. But when you look at the lineup, it's it's an okay lineup. It's an okay team. I, it, we'll see what happens with Christian Yelich. He had a little, a little bit of a reawakening last year because everyone was so worried he's obviously changed his profile a little bit as a hitter as opposed to prior to the back being a big issue um i think wilson contreras is um i'm sorry william contreras is a is a phenomenal catcher one of the top ones in at least in the nl um but yeah it, it's definitely an interesting lineup from the youth perspective bryce terang also uh rounding things out but you know for me at least it's going to be keeping the likes of contreras yelich and uh, Hoskins in check, and then obviously not letting someone exciting that, um, you know, exciting like Jackson Churio can be an electric type of ball player to take over a game. I think, I think those are the biggest things for that lineup. Yeah, there's, um, I think projected 11 players making their first opening day, um, uh, lineup or opening day roster on the, um, on the Brewers, so you can get a little idea of where they're going and where they expect to be. A bit of a transition mm-hmm. year for them. Um, you know, the the guys with the names scare me a little bit, right? Like, you know, I know Yelich is a different player, but he's the guy. Like, you can't let, to Ibby's point, you can't yet let Yelich or Adamas or Hoskins or Contreras beat you, you know? Right. Um, 
yeah, trio's a great prospect, but we'll see. You know, we'll you see, can't yeah. let the four guys in the middle beat you. Um, I think uh I think the Mets on paper are a better team because I think they match up well, right? Like you've got mm-hmm. Adama as well, you got Lindor, you got Hoskins, you got Alonzo, you've got Nimo in the outfield, and you've got uh, uh Contreras and you've got Alvarez. So Alvarez, I yeah. think they they match up well. I think the Mets uh complementary pieces are maybe a little bit better. So um yeah, I don't know. To me, the, the the biggest thing is hoping that maybe uh you know Milwaukee's really bad and we can get Willie Adams in the deadline to play third base. I didn't get a chance <laughs> to say that on my on, on the bold predictions today, but you know, Willie Adams is the name. If things don't work out for you know Brett Beatty and Vientos and Short and Wendell and all the all the you know the lack of we have behind them are those options. I wouldn't be shocked if you know if the Brewers did fall out of it and he, you know, David Stearns puts in a phone call to an old friend and says, Hey, let me get Willie Adams to be my third baseman. I do think with him being on half a year at that point, you know, the possibility does remain. I wonder if, if they would want to trade with the Mets uh, after all that has gone, that has gone down with trying to get David Stearns in here and that whole issue. I wonder if they, they would want to trade, you know, with, with us at this point in time. Um, if it, things match up, you never know. Never know. Yeah. got to watch out for the Dodgers. I'm not really sure if Mookie Betts is uh, going to be the shortstop. You know, that's Mookie that Betts plays like every up. position now. Yeah. And he's, but, and he's the top guy at every position. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. According to MLB network, he's the best right field with the best second baseman and the best shortstop. You know, what's crazy about that list. I'm sorry. Like to just put him ahead of some people where it's like, nobody's doubting how good Mookie Betts is as an offensive player. He's absolutely terrific, but defense is a factor. And thus far he's not been good. He's been I'd say below average for a major league shortstop. So I, if I were other shortstops on that list, I'd be a little insulted by that because part of it is it's also a defensive position. And so I think it's a little ridiculous. Like, Oh, he gets moved and he's the second best shortstop in the league behind Corey Seager. Like, is he though? I think when, when, when it comes to those lists, I think a lot of times they're just looking at stat lines, not looking at the entire player. They're not looking at the position itself. Like, yes, there are plenty of guys that are better defensively, but we know how these lists work. It's all about names. They, they, when they talk about power hitters and Pete Alonso's not on the power hitters, when he's not on the home runs, it's like, what, what the hell are you trying to accomplish? You're like, what are you doing? Are you doing any work? Did you do any homework on anything? No, you didn't. It's just you're looking at lines and you know what's going to grab engagement. That's what it always. That's what it's going to be continuously, and that's unfortunate, but that's the truth. That's like when they put Harper uh, be above about two or three top first basemen because now he, you know, we all know what Harper is offensively, but like yeah. he just got to first base. Like, how are we making him one of the top first basemen? I know it's not like the craziest position yeah. uh, to, to handle, but still, like, you know, Freeman is up there. Uh, you know, Olsen, Alonzo should have been ahead of him. Mm-hmm. So I, it's crazy. Joel C. Coming in with the facts, I totally forgot about that. We just traded him for Hauser and Taylor with Milwaukee. How I, how could I forget that one? But yeah, I mean, it, no, but, but to it, your point, but to your point before, like maybe it's I, I don't think it would be, but maybe it'd be like there's a difference between Hauser and Taylor versus what Willie Adamas is, which is a thirty plus home run bat, and maybe they were like, nah, we'll give you this, we'll give you these guys, but we're not going to give you we're not going to give you what you really want. But I don't think that would be the case. But I I think if things match up properly, but I do think he will be a hot name at the deadline regardless um for from from a multiple um, a multitude of teams including like John alluded to the Dodgers. Here's a plug for excellent fun vibrant talks podcast. Hey, what's up John, Avi and Ann? Sorry I'm late. I just recorded an episode of his sports podcast along with some breaking news that he talked about. So Ooh. we're always uh is that G Money Stacks? I can't remember if that was G Money Stacks or not. I remember they had a podcast too. But if it is, what's up G Money? Hey, we got 129 people in here. Make sure you hit the What's like. What's up, good people? The subscribe button as well for both Till Mets to his part and Subway to Shay. Um, going to wrap up some of the show here. I want to talk about Francisco Alvarez real quick. Mm-hmm. And because today, Will Smith of the Dodgers got a 10-year extension worth $140 million. Is this what we can look forward to? when it comes to a contract for Francisco Alvarez. John, do you want to go first or want me to go first? Uh, yeah. I'll take it really quick because yeah. there are some similarities. I think it's a comparable blueprint, but um, I think the biggest takeaway is that, you know, people were kind of saying, oh my God, the Mets have to extend Alvarez right now, like at the end of last season. And sure, 
I'm not going to say no to it, but Ibby and I talked on our podcast about how, you know, there's really another year to go before you have to do it. Now you don't yeah. want to wait and you don't want to find yourself in the, the, the Pete Alonzo uh, camp where they could have done it early, early and got it done as, as they got into basically last year, there's no incentive for him to sign an extension at that point. So you don't want to get there, but, um, I, I think the other thing is, is that Will Smith has been around for a couple more years. So, you know, I think that's it, yeah. a good blueprint, but Will Smith is already one of the best catchers in the sport. I think Alvarez has the potential to be the best catcher in the sport. That's how good I believe he is. Um, and if you buy that and you want to bank on it right now, go for it. But I just think that's a decent number to look at. And uh, Joel C put it in the comments, uh, eight years, 85 million. Kiebert Ruiz got eight years, 60. You kind of split the diff and put them right in between the middle of those two deals. Um, sure. But I just think Met fans just have a little bit of patience. Um, let this play out a little bit more. There's no reason that they have to do this right now this year. Um, you know, but it's, it's, it's certainly a, it's, it's, it, it definitely opens up, like where your head goes. You look at the Ruiz deal, you look at the Will Smith deal. And I think Alvarez, if he were going to sign that like this year or before next season, some point, I think you're looking at right in the middle of those two deals. I'm trying, I'm doing the math real quick. Um, so really it was an extension on the two, it bought, it bought out essentially the two Arb years. So really it's a eight year deal for 112 million by buying out those two Arb years. If you're going to look at it in that sense, but uh, is it a blueprint? I mean, I, I still think if you if you offer him something in the off season coming up, once money goes down, you can reset things and attack how you really want to. Uh, I think you could be looking at what Joel was saying, and those are the numbers that I floated on the show when we talked about it as well. I think you can offer him something in the the high eighties, low nineties potentially if he goes out and has a strong year and hits thirty plus home runs. Um, I, I think that's what you could be looking at now. I don't know who he's represented by. I don't think he's repped by any of the big ones. I don't know if it's CAA. I don't think it's Boris. Um, Is it with Bad Bunnies? Um, I, I it, think so. Actually, okay. Okay. So uh, how they would choose to go about it. And another thing we got we got to look at when it comes to stuff like this is, is there going to be a turning of the tide, not just at this catcher position because this happens with Smith, but with baseball in general, where you're watching – teams whether it's buying out the arb years at a more higher clip now because players are or i don't want to say fearing because i think it's dependent on the player but wanting to lock in that big money based off of an extension as opposed to going to free agency and allowing things to bottom out like it did for some players now every player is different i do not believe that this is going to happen for juan soto next year so everyone who thinks that they're dunking on scott boris for the offseason that he had he still has you know, Juan Soto and Pete Alonso to go, he's still going to be making money. So there's no reason to really dunk on him in that sense. But I think it's going to be player dependent. But if you do show up with a strong offer for someone that, you know, is of a younger age and, you know, they they look at the landscape and they say, yeah, I'll, I'll take $90 million for the next eight years. Yeah, I'll, I will take that for my position that I play. It takes me to 35 years old or whatever it may be. Um, I think that is something that can play. But I think he would because he doesn't have the so-called – I should say he doesn't have the track record of a Will Smith just yet if you attack him next offseason and said, to Joel's point, to what I said on the show previously, in that 80 to $90 million range over six, seven, eight years, whatever it may be, I think that that's the, the blueprint that you're really looking at. I don't even think it's going to ha- – it would happen next season, uh, next offseason because you, you're talking about you know Pete Alonzo. If the Mets really want to go in after Juan Soto, we got to – full rotation that has to be, you know, replenished, um, especially if they don't decide to go to the kids, which I I think that if, if a guy like Tyler McGill, Jose Budo, if those guys can show out this season, if we see more progress from some of the kids, maybe that makes less of an emphasis to go after starting pitcher in in the off season. And maybe they just go to try to get an ACE of a staff, maybe a Max Fried or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, I could see something like that happening, but uh, Corey Holzer, uh, makes perfect sense here and says this front office is going to take their time to analyze the organization before signing any extension. And that's what, you know, that's what David Stearns I mean, has talked about, right? I mean, we mentioned it. Uh, David Stearns hasn't lied one bit 
uh, in any of his conversations. He said he was going to evaluate the kids. He wanted to see them play. But if an opportunity came, he would take it. Uh, he did just that with J.D. Martinez. And it, it seems to, you know, hopefully on the field. On paper, it has worked out. Let's see if it works out on the field. Uh, as we're starting to wrap up here a little bit, uh, what what are you guys looking forward to when it comes to this series? What do you want to see from the Mets uh, as we go into the first series of the season. You go, baby. I'm thinking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I had something, but now Love I got up. Uh, no, I, I would say, <laughs> I would say for me, I, I think a lot of people are going to be right away looking to the pitching. And I'm not trying to dismiss the pitching right away because obviously I want to see it do well out of the gate. But Based off the spring that we watched, the up and down nature that uh, that things can be uh, in the beginning of the season for this team, for some of our hitters that sometimes take a little bit of time to get warmed up, uh, whether it's you know Pete when he goes through streaks or Lindor or even Nimmo. Um, I think that I'm really watching this offense because I, I keep on saying, and I'm going to stick with it all year, it's about jumping the scoreboard. It's about scoring early. It's about playing defense. It's about you got to score runs though. Like you have to score runs in order to make your defense really matter. And if your pitching is going to give up some, because look, we think the pitching can be solid, but it's not going to, I don't think it's going to be all world. So if they're giving up three runs, four runs here, like you got to score four, you got to score five, you got to score six. Like you got it. You got to be able to score a run. So I'm really focused on the offense. I want the offense to establish, uh, establish itself early because when you give pitchers a lead, you can pitch with a little bit of comfort and you, you know, pitching from ahead is a lot different than pitching from behind or pitching in a tie game. Okay. Or, or with no score. It's a, it's, it's a much, uh, it gives you a little bit more room for error, if you will. So I'm really focused on the offense. I want to see, obviously I want to see that top half of the lineup do the damage that I think it can do, but obviously watching the back end as well. What can, what are we going to see this first weekend, these first, you know, seven to 10 days out of DJ Stewart, depending on how much time they give him. Jeff McNeil off of the injury, Starling Marte off of last season and this poor spring. Like that's, that's what I'm really curious about. I want to see what the offense is able to do over the first, you know, two weeks of the season. Um, yeah, I guess my, my answer is kind of threefold. Um, cause it ties into a lot of what I was looking at and projecting at the end of our show when we kind of made our, our picks for, record and stuff. Um, I think uh, Carlos Ramos in the comments nails my first one. More innings pitch from the starters. Um, yeah. I've said it. I said it today. I've said it all winter. Um, if the Mets got league average starting pitching last year, I think that they make the playoffs. I don't think that they sell at the deadline the way that they do. I think they're closer to being in the hunt. Those pitchers that they traded off, if they do better, they're still on the team probably, and we're talking about a different thing. Now, what they do in the playoffs, probably not much of anything, but you know, you got to remember Carlos Carrasco, unpitchable. Max Scherzer is supposed to be the ace going two and two thirds innings and, you know, uh, not getting a lot of length anywhere in the in the uh, rotation. Verlander being out for the first, whatever it was, month or six weeks of the year, all that stuff. So I think that this season, the rotation has a, higher floor, but a lower ceiling. And I think that's okay. So give us innings yeah. pitch effectively. And I'd like to see that start right away because I would like it to continue from the, the uh, from spring. The other thing is uh, more power. And I don't mean home runs necessarily. I just want them to drive the ball. I want them to make more solid contact, more extra yeah. base hits. Um, I, I think in a way you could tie in situational hitting into that, but I don't mean it in the sense of slap the ball the other way. I mean, there's a runner on base, knock the runner in. If there's a runner in scoring position, drive them in play to play to drive that runner in. So, and I think the Mets have the power to do it. I predicted on our show that they're going to have five hitters with 30 or 30 plus home runs. And I stand by that. So do that. Let's drive the ball doubles let's have guys with you know really pretty looking ops and ops plus numbers like i think that's where their deficiencies were offensively more than anything else and then the third one is very simple edwin diaz yeah no uh you hit it all on the head starting it's all starts with starting pitching for me uh, I need to see at least five innings we were talking about this with wardy today and he was like talking about you know how these these pitchers need to you know you know give good length and it's like Five innings is all we can get at this point in time. If they can give us five innings, 
Goes I think the way. bullpen could go a long way. And the fact that Edwin Diaz is back, it's all, you know, all relative. They it's all linked to each other. That's how they fell apart last year. And that's how they can, you know, rise to the occasion this year. And I hope to see that from the starting pitchers. I hope to see it from the bullpen. And like you said, the hitting, uh, th there needs to be better situational hitting with runners in scoring position for sure. They got to knock the runs in. They got to get them in. And that bottom third of the lineup, who posted it? I think it was Joel C. Uh, he says it's very suspect now. It's been very suspect since last year. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, uh, hopefully, you know, Brett Beatty can change a whole lot if he could start hitting. You know, obviously we know what Brett, uh, uh, Harrison Bader is, but if Brett Beatty – uh, can you know find himself? I, I think that that's a, a, a major positive uh, for this team that that will take. Uh, gentlemen, uh, I know it's it's been a long day for everyone here. Uh, you got a flight. You got to eat some pizza. Um, so <laughs> let let's wrap it up here. Uh, nice little comment from uh, excellent fun sports. Make sure, yeah, remember to hit the like button, subscribe to the, our channels. For Mets uh, till Mets do his part and Subway to Shea, guys, plug whatever else you want before we wrap up here. Um, I guess I'll just take a minute since um, you, you know, you you put it on my lower third. I, I know this is not a football <laughs> podcast, but um, listen, no, seriously, like there's a lot of overlap between Mets and Jets. There's a lot of Mets fans who are Jets fans and vice versa. Like myself, Ibby is not, and I don't know what your allegiance is, but um, I, I'm a diehard. You don't want to know. Fan. You don't I have know another. I, mean. I have another uh, show that I host called The Goddamn Jets. I have two amazing co-hosts on that uh, show as well, and uh, we go live the same way Till Mets Do His Part does. Um, we're just uh, four thirty p.m. Excuse me, seven thirty p.m. Eastern time. I'm in my West Coast brain. Seven thirty p.m. Eastern time every Tuesday. So, and that's also same, same deal courtesy of Brella sports. And, uh, we've got the live show the way this is live. And then we drop as a podcast and all the same platforms. So, um, yeah, Joel C. Um, and, uh, who else? Corey, you guys jump in. Uh, I know Carson, you're a, a Raider fan and, and tone. I know I was, uh, get, talking smack to him about, uh, their, their nickel corner and stuff. So, <laughs> so, but yeah, but listen, if you're, if you're a Jets fan and, and you, and you want to, uh, you, you want to join on, please, by all means do. We'd love to have you. Uh, and as for me, I'm just going to plug, obviously follow till Mets to his part, follow myself on Twitter. It's where I am the most or X, whatever we're calling it at poison underscore Ibby, as you can see listed right over here. Follow my partner as well. Follow all the things that he's doing. We have a lot of fun with the show. We're trying to grow as Ant is. This entire community is awesome. We love supporting each other, and everyone grows. Everyone gets a piece of the pie. It's going to be a fun season. I can't wait to collaborate with everyone and keep on growing and talking Mets like the way that we love to do. And yeah, uh, that's uh, we're all we're, again across all the platforms. As, as John's wearing his, <laughs> he's wearing the Jets chain. Um, Following us across all the platforms, uh, following us on all the podcast platforms as well. Um, you know, Twitter, Instagram, our Facebook community. We have a TikTok. We're going to try to be a little bit more active with that. I have some ideas for the YouTube short version of our show as well that I'm going to try to start implementing uh, within the first week of the season, see how it takes off. But yeah, follow the show. Follow me. Follow John. Follow Ant. Support everyone within this community. They're all awesome. And, yeah, uh, we, we as always, uh, LGM. Yeah, we appreciate all of you. 137 here in the chat. Thank you for everyone who came in here. Uh, it's been a blast. You follow me. You can see all my stuff on the bottom right there. Twitter, Instagram, <laughs> X at Subway to Shea. And follow the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. We appreciate you so much. Enjoy the season. And like Ibby said, let's go Mets. <laughs>